We're going through this series right now called Last Words, where we're examining the seven last statements of Jesus from the cross. And what we have in Scripture is he made seven statements from the cross. Three of them are in John, three of them are in Luke, and one of them's in Matthew. And from what we can tell in Scripture, uh, three of the statements were made at the very beginning of his time on the cross. And then four of them, the statements were made uh, at the very end of his time on the cross. But as we've been examining last words, we, we know the importance of last words, not just from Jesus, but from uh, history. Let me tell you a story about this man. This is a big old huge book. It's called, this man is called Dietrich Bonhoeffer. I've read this book a couple times, and by read, I mean I did it on audiobook. But uh, it's a great way to do books. Uh, feel free to say read if you did it on, on uh, audiobook. But what makes it so fascinating is Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a pastor in Germany during the rise of Nazism. And so part of this book gives an examination of that, how they were able to do that, and the implications that had for churches and, and Christians during that period of time. Um, but when uh, uh, the war, uh, World War II, was about to break out, Bonhoeffer was in England at the time. And he was doing a preaching tour and, and preaching to some churches up there. But as the war was about to break out, word got back to him that uh, they were going to shut Germany down so you couldn't get in and out. <clears throat> and so Bonhoeffer, the churches there in England, were saying, you stay here, we need your ministry here. If you go back, it's going to be all kinds of bad. You don't know what's going to go down, how they're going to treat you um, at the time. Because some of the Nazis at the time were, were feigning Christianity because they have a history of Christianity in Germany because of Martin Luther. Uh, and so they were abusing that to gain their authority. But the real Christians um, were being thrown in prison and ultimately concentration camps and killed and so those people in England were saying, do not go back because we know you're going to preach the gospel and that's not going to go well for you. And he said to those churches in England, well, I can't abandon those people in Germany. They need the gospel now more than ever. And so he got back into Germany just as they were shutting everything down. And he continued to preach the gospel there very boldly, very openly. Uh, even when people from the Nazi government were coming into churches and in uniform and in plain clothes to see what the guys were preaching and at some points dragging the pastors off of the platform and taking them straight to concentration camps. Um, but Bonhoeffer continued to preach boldly and some of his friends ended up recruiting him in Germany to be a spy. And uh, as a course of his work as a spy, they were, had developed this plot to assassinate Hitler. And it got, it got very far to the point they had uh, a bomb that they got into the room with Hitler. And the bomb went off. I don't know if you've heard this part of history. It's, it's fascinating. But the bomb went off, but the table that Hitler was standing behind was so big and so thick, it protected him from the explosion. Well, coming out of that, Hitler wanted to know everything he could about this conspiracy to kill him. And he put out all kinds of edicts and, and warrants for arrest and, and hits on people. And ultimately, as a part of that, Bonhoeffer got arrested and taken to a concentration camp. And uh, he had just gotten engaged as well. Uh, he was in his early, I believe, early 40s, taken to this concentration camp. And uh, he's there, and he's a man who loves Jesus. And so being in the concentration camp just meant that's another place for him to tell people about Jesus. And so he did. <laughs> Continued to share the gospel there. Uh, well, the war continued on for a number of years, and uh, word got to Hitler that it was not looking so good for him. Uh, things were, were coming to a head. He was in the bunker at this point. And so he put the word out. He had some guys come into his little office there in the bunker, and he said, I want you to go, and here's a list of so many names. You go and execute these guys right now. This is going to be one of my last, he didn't say this, but this would end up being one of his last acts as uh, the, uh, the leader there. And so these guys went out in to, to find these list of guys that they had been given uh, and execute them. And one of them was Bonhoeffer. Uh, well, Bonhoeffer at the time was in this one concentration camp. And uh, he got a feeling uh, from the Lord that his time was coming to an end. 
And he got convicted of the Lord to have a, a church service and share the gospel with the people who were in the room with him at this certain concentration camp. But he had been resistant to that because there was a guy in the room who was a staunch atheist and very outspoken about that fact. And Bonhoeffer just didn't want to get in a fight on his last day on earth. <laughs> uh, but some of the guys came to him and said, no, we really need this. And then, to his complete astonishment, the atheist said, Dietrich, we, uh, we really need you to do this for us. And so that was all he needed. He stood up and he preached the gospel. He prayed, and the second he said amen, two guys sent from Hitler for him walked in the room and said, come with us. And so they grabbed Bonhoeffer, and as they're dragging him out of the room, Bonhoeffer turns to one of his friends there, uh, and he says, this is the end. But for me, it's the beginning. And they take him, and they transport him to this other concentration camp a few hours away, and uh, they have a mock trial there. And as he's sentenced to die, he kneels down and prays. And then he gets up, and they don't have to drag him out to the gallows. He walks out to the gallows, walks up the planks, and gets up there to the top, and kneels and prays again. And then he dies. You see, what Bonhoeffer knew, would, it would end up having a profound impact, even on one of the guys who was standing there watching this, a guy who had a, par, a hand in killing thousands of people was his resignation to what was happening because of the joy that he was about to experience. Knowing that heaven was coming, knowing that seeing Jesus face to face was coming, he was not scared. And so he shared the gospel with everybody he could leading up to that moment. And what he said, this is the beginning for me, was absolutely true. And so what we see, looking at Bonhoeffer there in the concentration camps, walking up, being executed, it's, it would seem as though he... he, he was all alone. He had been abandoned. If anybody should be rescued from that moment, it should be him. But he knew that he was not abandoned. And walking up those wooden steps, he knew God was with him even there. Which is interesting considering the word we're looking at today from Jesus. In uh, uh, Matthew chapter 27, uh, Matthew chapter 27 Jesus has been on the cross now for a number of hours. Uh, Matthew 27, starting at verse 45. It says, Now from the sixth hour, that's noon, they, they judge their hours based on about when sun rose, which for them was about 6 a.m. So he says, now from the sixth hour, noon, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. Now what's interesting is there's all kinds of discussions and arguments about how this, dark, this darkness came. Was it an eclipse? Was it cloud cover? Was it supernatural completely and it just blacked everything out? Uh, well, we don't really know. All we know is there was just dark everywhere for these three hours. And during that period, at the end of that period, verse 46, about the ninth hour, 3 p.m., Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani? That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, the phrasing is interesting because those first two words, Eli, Eli, those are uh, uh, Hebrew and those last two words are Aramaic. You see, back then people spoke a lot of languages, particularly in this area. The hardcore, devout, orthodox Jews, only they spoke Hebrew. They spoke Hebrew everywhere. They spoke Hebrew at home. Uh, the, the Gentiles in this region spoke Aramaic. That's the language they spoke, and everybody spoke Greek. That was like the common tongue that everybody spoke, which is why, honestly, the New Testament's written in Greek, because it's what everybody spoke. And so Jesus says this phrase in both Hebrew and Aramaic, parts of both, that mean, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So it would appear, Jesus, on the cross, he's dying, that he's been abandoned. He says these words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But really, <laughs> I, I, talk, I mentioned this to Katie earlier in the week. This is, this is a hard one to wrap your head around for a whole bunch of different reasons. Because Jesus is God. And so if Jesus is God, how can he say, why have you forsaken me? 
But how can God forsake himself? How can God abandon himself? But also, if Jesus is dying on the cross and he needs to die, otherwise we can't have salvation. God has to die, otherwise the death isn't powerful enough to pay for all our sins. It, he, he is that much greater than us that his one death pays for all of our sins. So at the moment of death, he, he had to be fully God. Some people say that he, he gave up some of his divine nature in this moment. But that can't happen because he has to be fully God when he dies, otherwise we're not saved. And so then still, why does he say, why have you forsaken me? If he is fully God when he dies, which he has to be for us to be saved, then why does he say this? Maybe something else is going on here in what he's saying. Because this, these words that he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is a quote from scripture. This is a quote from Psalm 22, a Psalm of David. This is actually the opening phrase of that entire psalm. It's not even all of verse 1. It's just the opening phrase. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And Psalm 22 is interesting because as with many of David's psalms, it starts in a place of perceived desperation. And as David continues to talk or write down the words, it it ends in a place of great faith. Uh, So let's look there real quick. Psalm, I, added, I think I added them this morning, didn't I, Alyssa? Yeah, okay. Um, let me flip there real quick. Psalm 22. All right, here we go. Let's look at just the first few verses. It says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? So David is in a desperate place in him crying out in this way. It appears that God has forsaken him. At least that's the way he feels, and that's the way he's describing it. Verse 2, Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but I find no rest. Yet, you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you our fathers trusted. They trusted, and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. So we see in the first two verses of Psalm 22 that Jesus quotes from, David feels as though he's been abandoned. But then David goes on to those next few verses and talks about, but God, I know you don't abandon people because you've rescued so many people who've come before me time and time again. Now jump down to verse 24. David says, speaking of God, for he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. Here's the key phrase. And he has not hidden his face from him, but has heard when he cried to him. So he says, God has not hidden his face from the afflicted, speaking of himself. David's speaking of himself as the one who's afflicted. He says, God has not abandoned me. Even though he says, I felt like it, I felt like I was forsaken. And to any outside observer, it looked like I was. But in reality, here in verse 24, he says, that's not the case. God has been with me this entire time. God was always there. God never left me. He has always been with me. Well, we see there in Matthew 27, we just looked at a moment ago, Jesus was in a situation that appeared to outside observers that he had been abandoned by God. And if you go on in that passage, in crying, Eli, Eli, everyone, some of the people surrounding him thinks he's calling out to Elijah, because that's the opening phrase of the word Elijah. And so they're mocking him. And so saying, look, God's abandoned him. God's left him. Not even Elijah's coming to save him. He's all alone up there. But he's quoting from a passage of scripture that's not about, it's about a feeling of loneliness But God is still there. God is still present. And so Jesus being mocked, Jesus being mocked because of who he was, Jesus being mocked because of what he said, Jesus being being mocked because of the situation he was in, being crucified. So what does he do then? He quotes scripture. If you're in that scenario, feeling abandoned, feeling alone, is scripture the first thing that would pop into your head? Normally. 
Jesus quotes scripture. He quotes it out loud so everyone around him can hear him. He's speaking to the loneliness in Psalm 22 that he quotes, but also in God's provision, in God's rescue, as that psalm speaks of, in the middle of what he's going through. Because he quotes scripture because Jesus knew scripture. He knew what God said in Joshua chapter 1, verses 7 through 9. God said to Joshua, about to go into the promised land and take it over, only be strong and very courageous, being careful to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Now, the law was scripture. That's, all, that's the only scripture they had at this point in time. He says, be careful to do according to what scripture says. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, so that you may have good success wherever you go. This book of the law, scripture, shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. So God is telling Joshua, know scripture, memorize scripture, speak scripture, apply scripture, and you will find prosperity and success, as God defines it, but you will find it in your life. Verse 9, have I not commanded you? So what follows on the heels of scripture? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened. Do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. So courage and strength come with Scripture. Courage and strength come with Scripture. Even as Jesus only quotes the opening phrase of this entire psalm, he knew this psalm. Because God gave Scripture to every one of the people who wrote it down. 2 Timothy chapter 3. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. All scripture is breathed out by God. So every piece of scripture in we have in this book Genesis 1, all the way through the end of Revelation. God put it there. God inspired it. God breathed it into the guys who wrote it down. So, and who is God? Jesus. So David writing down Psalm 22, Jesus was there when he wrote it down. And Jesus speaks it from the cross. The opening phrase of that entire passage. Jesus knew, knows what scripture is, knows the power that is in scripture. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Scripture is powerful. It can cut through any mess. It can cut through any calluses. Any, it can cut through any walls we have built up within us to hide who we really are and how we really feel from anybody else. Scripture gets to the heart of the matter. And even though, I mean, Jesus was there, I mean, when, when David wrote Psalm 22, he, uh, he was there when God spoke Joshua 1 to Joshua, but even though as Jesus dying on the cross, 2 Timothy 3 and Hebrews 4 haven't been written yet, Jesus is eternal and knows what's coming, and he knew those scriptures even though they hadn't been written down yet. And so he knows the power of the word. You see, because scriptural knowledge and memorization, and demonstration, expression, and application cut through any attack that comes upon us with peace, and with power, and strength, and unmatched perseverance. Because I don't know if you know this, enemy's out to get you. And he's going to bring anything he can, any strategy he can against you. He's seen in his many, many years of temptation, he's seen somebody like you before. And he knows what strategies to bring against you. He has an arsenal. He has a toolbox. And he works it. And the only way to defeat his strategy is with God's word. Look at Ephesians chapter 6. I don't think I have, this is going to be Ephesians 6.10. I don't think this one's on the screen. No, it's not. Um, This is uh, Paul writing. 
He says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, stand firm. So what Paul is saying is, we're not fighting against other people. You say, yeah, but you don't know this person, man, they are messing up, they're messing me up, they are causing all kinds of problems, and they are irritating, and and they are saying this, and this, and this, and this, and they are my enemy. But in reality, from what Paul is saying, they're not the enemy. The enemy is the enemy. And what the enemy, one strategy of the enemy is to get us confused against who we're fighting against. We're not fighting against each other, we're fighting the enemy. We're trying to bring each other closer to Jesus in the process. Working together for that. That doesn't mean the enemy can't, you know, manipulate someone else or their words in our mind to make us think they're the enemy. They're not. He is. They need Jesus just like I need Jesus. And we need to bring each other along in the process. And we have to remember who the enemy is. Who the real enemy is. And so what Paul is saying in Ephesians chapter 6 is put on the armor of God. Use God's word in a powerful way to fight against the schemes. He says it right there in the passage, the schemes of the devil. And he's a schemer. He's a schemer. He doesn't fight fair. He'll use everything in his disposal to mess you up. Because look at what Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Though we walk in the flesh... We're not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but here it is, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. It may feel sometimes like we're fighting physical things or physical people or physical health problems or physical financial stress or physical things going on overarching in the world. But what Paul is telling us is, We're not fighting physical things. Physical things will pass away. The battle is spiritual. The battle is deeper than that. If there is a physical confrontation and a physical disagreement, there's something deeper going on, a spiritual issue that's going on. And so what Paul says is, don't use weapons of this world or don't fight like people who don't know Jesus. Speaking like people who don't know Jesus, slapping each other down with words like people who don't know Jesus. Don't raise your hand, but do you know of anyone who uses words like a weapon? Do you? When somebody slaps you with words, you slap right back. You try to slap a little bit harder to shut the thing down. Paul is telling us in 2 Corinthians, we're not supposed to do that. We're not waging war according to the flesh. We're not waging war with, this, with the way this world does because he says our weapons of warfare are not of the flesh. Our weapons have divine power to destroy strongholds. Why do you think, Scripture tells us, a gentle answer turns away wrath? Not a wrathful answer destroys wrath. A gentle answer turns away wrath. Our weapons have divine power to destroy strongholds. Because of, and what are, what are our weapons? That's, Paul says that in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17. The helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, Scripture. If you look in that Ephesians 6 passage, he lists out a bunch of different elements of the armor of God. And as as has been often said, the only one that is offensive, the only one that strikes back is the sword, is Scripture. That's the only way we can make any headway is with Scripture. That's the only way we we can move forward. That's the only way we can have peace and strength and power is applying the word of God that he spoke to us. You say, I've never heard God speak. Well, here's a whole bunch of words that he spoke 
There's a whole bunch of them. A whole bunch of them right here. I mean, mine, let's see, before you get to the weights and measures and maps in the back, it's 1,042 pages. That's 1,042 pages of words he spoke. And so I, if I say, well, I've never heard God speak, well, maybe I'm not listening. <laughs> He's speaking a lot. He spoke a lot. And he'll continue to speak through Scripture. And once you recognize his voice, he'll speak in other avenues. But continue to speak through Scripture. Because Scripture has divine power to destroy strongholds. Jesus on the cross, appearing as though he were abandoned, appearing as though he had been forsaken, quotes Scripture. Jesus, Matthew 4, in the desert, tempted by Satan. What does he do? Quotes Scripture. The only way he defeats the enemy, he, he quotes scripture, and then he's on the cross about to die for the sins of the world, and he quotes scripture. Because our weapon is the word. Our weapon is the word. Our weapon is not just random words we pull out of the sky. Our weapon is the word, God's word, used and applied and, and, and spoken into our lives. I've been amazed at my own kids working through Bible drill and the, word, the, the amount of scripture they know. I wish I knew that kind of amount of scripture at their age. It would have made uh, teenage years a lot easier to have God's word that readily at my disposal. And now as I am turning 40 this year and, and my uh, uh, ability to memorize things is not what it once was, uh, it's a lot more difficult these days. Uh, but our weapon is the word. And so you have to ask yourself then, do you feel like you're in a tough spot sometimes? Well, your weapon is the word. Do you feel like you need strength? Your weapon is the word. Do you ever feel like you need peace, that, 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 that you just can't get the peace? Your weapon is the word. Do you ever feel like your mind just runs away and all you experience is anxiety? Your weapon against that is the Word. The Word is your weapon. The Word is your tool. The Word is the power that, that, that can infuse your life with stuff you never knew before. I've mentioned it many times. The man named George Mueller, in his journals, 20,000 some odd physical prayers, he, that he, I mean, prayers that he physically wrote down that were answered in the affirmative. And I absolutely believe it's because of the amount of scripture that he ingested. Reading scripture over 200 times in the course of his life. And he wasn't saved, I think, in, in, two, in the early 20s. <laughs> and he read scripture over and over and over again. And God just blessed his life in such an incredible way. Our weapon is the word. You need a weapon. You need a weapon to combat this stuff. You need a weapon, and it's not just distraction. That's not a good weapon. Binge watching is not a good weapon. That puts it off. That's, a, that's an anesthetic for a moment. It's still going to be there. You're just not thinking about it. You need a weapon, and the weapon for us as believers, the weapon is the word. And so I'm going to challenge you something. Over the next few weeks leading up to Easter, there's only a few more weeks till Easter, we're going to be doing something as a church. Um, I'm going to be putting out a verse of the week. We've got a newsletter that's going to go out with a verse of the week starting tomorrow. It's on our website. Go to our website. Some of you go right now. In the bottom corner, there's a little button that says next steps. You click on that, and one of the options there, I mean, you can make a decision. You can ask for prayer. You can give. Uh, there may be one more, but one of them is the verse of the week, a uh, little wording. You punch that, ask for your name and your email. And you'll be, you just fill that out, you put your name, your email, submit, you're going to get an email tomorrow morning with the verse of the week, this first one. And it'll be every week from now until Easter, and if enough of you like it, we'll keep doing it. But this first one's super short, it's not hard, it's very, I'm not going to give it to you, you've got to be a part of the email deal to get it. But, it's, but I'll tell you, it, it's very short, it's just two short phrases. It, it's, uh, and it's not even a whole verse, it's just a part of a verse, but it's a powerful part. Um, about knowing God's will, uh, following after the Lord. And so this is what this is. We need to know Scripture because when we find ourselves in tough spots, God will bring those Scriptures to our minds and we will need them. 
And if we don't have scripture at our disposal for him to pull from and, and remind us of and empower us with, who knows what we will grab at to try to strengthen us and give us the, the perseverance we need in the moment. So I challenge you to be a part of this deal. Verse of the week, starting tomorrow. Sign it up today. Sign it up right now. Some of you are doing it. I can see you on your phone. Sign it up. Do it. Verse of the week, we're going to start it and, 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 and be challenging each other and growing together. And uh, we'll be mentioning it throughout the week. If you see another, somebody who's in the room, ask them about the verse of the week and how they're doing with it. Um, because scripture, as we just saw, 2 Corinthians 10, has divine power to destroy strongholds. You're going to find yourself in a scenario, in a situation that is difficult, that is challenging. Maybe you don't know how you got there. Maybe you don't know what to do now, what to say now. Maybe it's so overwhelming, you don't know how to dig yourself out of the hole that you find yourself in. And if scripture is within you, everything will change. You're not only going to find your way out of a hole, you're going to find a way to prevent falling in others. Doesn't mean you're never going to fall, but it's going to give you the strength to keep moving forward. No scripture. And the help that Jesus offers through scripture, it's available to everyone who believes. It, it's, it's a point of access for everyone who knows Jesus. And so, you have to ask yourself then, do you know Jesus? Do you need that help? Do you need that strength? It starts with knowing Jesus. And he can relate to anything you've been through. Having been tempted in every single way every one of us has, Scripture tells us. He walked to this earth. He lived at a very difficult time in history. And he shows us how to live. He speaks how to live. He, he, I mean, he demonstrates it and he speaks it. And then he died and he rose from the dead so that we can live after we die. All you have to do is believe that. That he, son of God, died so all your sins would be forgiven. And he rose from the dead so you can live after you die. You don't have to do X, Y, and Z good things before you get into heaven. You don't have to say a special phrase, like a you know, password to get into heaven. You don't have to pay a cover charge to get into heaven. What scripture tells us is the only way to heaven is belief. It's not belief plus doing a bunch of stuff. It's not belief plus saying a bunch of stuff. It's not belief plus paying a bunch of stuff. It's just belief. And, that, and, and, and the belief in what Jesus did for us, it, that's the key. It's what Jesus did for us, not something we can do for ourselves. It's what Jesus did for us. That, his, his death and resurrection were so powerful that even if you do something tomorrow that is a terribly egregious sin and you're embarrassed to show your face anywhere, Jesus is still with you. Jesus isn't going to walk away from you because you slip up and fall down. He never will. Never. You know, you know David, great King David, fought Goliath, did great things as king, defeated great many enemies, and then he slipped up in some terrible ways, had adultery with one of his friends, had that friend killed and executed, murdered, and then he repented. And you know, in, in the book of Acts, it says that David was a man after God's own heart. And you know when it says that? After he did all that bad stuff. Not before, after. God is not going to walk away from you. Ever. Ever. He's not going to abandon you. He can redeem anybody of anything. The fact that you're still here breathing, walking this earth, means he's not done with you yet. You still have something to do for him. He still wants you. Will you believe in him today? Will you walk with him today? And if you're in the room or you're watching online and you need to make a decision for Jesus today, stop the arguing in your head and say, all right, 
Today's the day. Stop listening to the schemes of the devil and listen to the word of God and come to believe. Closing words of the book of Revelation. It says, come all who are thirsty. Come. Will you come to Jesus today and believe in him and know him? I'll be standing here at the front. In just a minute, I'm going to pray. Music team's going to sing. And if you need to know Jesus and you're in the room, I'll be standing right here. I want to talk to you. I want to pray with you. I want to celebrate with you. If you're watching online, there's a little link below, wherever you're watching, Facebook, YouTube, website, whole deal. Little link says, I made a decision. You click on that, and, and it sends an email to me, and I'll call you today and, and uh, celebrate <laughs> with you about the decision you're making. Don't let the day go by. Don't let the moment go by without making that decision today for Jesus. Will you believe in Jesus today? Will you follow him? And will you begin, as we, we do this verse of the week deal, will you begin to increase your arsenal on the schemes of the devil and fight against him? Strengthen your heart. Bring peace into your life. He's with you always. He will never leave you or forsake you. He's with you now, sitting in one of those little green pews.